Hi, this is your host Sapil Bharti and today we have with us once again Javier Perez, Chief Evangelist of Open Source and Security at Perfor Software. Javier, it's great to have you on the show. Hey, great to be here again. Good talking to you. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a while. Today's topic is more or less uh, about the state of open source. If we look at things in general, if we look at our own career, it was more about telling folks why to use open source for the benefits today. Literally everybody is using open source with or without realizing that they are using it. The problem that comes with it, that if they don't know that they are using open source, they kind of uh, fail to become good open source citizens because open source does not mean just consume. It also means you should be active participants. Uh, so once again, this topic can go in so many di di different directions. But if I ask you, you have been in this industry for so long, how do you see uh, where is open source today in terms of, of course, adoption, but more or less like awareness about that, hey, we are using open source? It keeps growing, Swampil. It keeps growing. Uh, we just recently did a, a big survey, the 2022 State of Open Source Report, and, and we were wanted to hear uh, what's the real status, right? Uh, especially focus on in organizations, right? I mean, obviously, we know that many developers are using, consuming, contributing to open source. But we wanted to see what you know, how much open source is being used in organizations. And well, first of all, it keeps growing. We ask a question: Has your organization increased the use of open source over the last twelve months? And guess what? The answer was rounded: yes. Right? Seventy-seven percent say yes. Thirty-six percent of that seventy-seven said significantly. Right? They increased the use of open source significantly. Uh, so there are uh, many. Um, points there that guide us to, yes, there's a lot more use and there's a lot more uh, contributions to open source, the uh, foundations, right? The Linux foundations and all the other, uh, the Apache Software Foundation, they all keep growing. They all have more projects uh, that, are, that are growing. We have some major areas, right? Around DevOps, around cloud native, around security, growing at a really fast pace. So if you're asking me uh, as an evangelist of open source, I'm really, really excited about how much this is growing. Uh, of course, there's also the, 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 the fact that companies are at different levels of their maturity using open source. So that's, that's an obviously another area that, that, that it has some really positive signs as well. When you say state of uh, open source report, who, uh, who created that report? It was a, a work between um, Perforce, uh, Open Logic by Perforce, the, the brand that uh, takes care of uh, supporting open source packages, open source support. And uh, we did it in co this in collaboration with the Open Source Initiative, OSI. So uh, we're really, really thankful to, I mean, I, it was great to work with uh, Stefano, who's heading the OSI, and uh, that also created more uh, uh, visibility. We had actually more than 2,600 respondents in six weeks, just six weeks more than 2,600 2, responses. Right, and the reason I asked you was, uh, I wanted to also discuss a bit about the company as well, that what do you folks do? Uh, how important is open source to you folks, or how are you associated with open source? Yeah, look, um, and I wanna to try to go quick on this one because I can spend an hour talking about it, but uh, Perforce uh, uh, sells uh, commercial software, um, all are, are, are related to DevOps. Um, has been growing uh, um, acquiring organizations. The most recent acquisition is uh, Puppet. It made, made big news. So uh, Perforce acquired Puppet just, just recently. And uh, we have a number of products that are based on open source, right? So obviously Puppet based on open source. We have uh, Zen, which is for PHP based on open source PHP. We have uh, Blaze Meter based on JMeter, open source JMeter. We have JRebel based on Java. And we have OpenLogic, which is the, the brand that I work most closely with, where we offer enterprise grade technical support for open source software. Now, having said that, as you know, all software is based on open source software, right? So we do uh, build all our other products with open source and support open source, right? So for example, in the case of Perfecto with uh, for testing, we support you know all the open source uh, testing uh, frameworks and uh, Android and 
you know, with the API management, we support uh, GraphQL, and, and I can go on and on and on, right? We all software are, all companies are software companies now, and they're all great open source software. Perfect. Now, let's go back to uh, the report that you folks did. We touched upon a bit. I also want to understand, as you know, it's quite clear that open source is literally running the word, but what kind of open source technology that you are seeing are you know in the adoption phase? Some are already you know in production phase. Lex kernel, we should not even talk about it. But what do you see there? One interesting point uh, finding on the on the on the survey on the report, uh, everyone talks about. We hear a lot about cloud native, right? The use of containers, containerization, the use of uh, orchestration, right? Kubernetes to orchestrate. Uh, all those uh, uh, large volumes of, of containers. And depending who you talk to, you know, so everyone is using it, yes. Well, something that we found that is it's only about 18% of the responders had uh, uh, Kubernetes in production. And, and that's, a, that's a low number, right? 18%, right? So, so the realities are that, it, and we also ask, by the way, you know what's at, towards the end of the survey? What's what's the most desirable technologies, right? Tell me what what do you want to go and do next, right? Then we ask. We gave options around things around obviously data science and AI, machine learning, and you know serverless and even quantum computing. But the number one most desirable technology was Kubernetes and Kubernetes operators, right? Environments there. So there still have. I think it still has a long, long, long path to, to keep growing that. Although some people are much more advanced than others, right? And uh, as we know, uh, you know, the future is here and uh, it's just unevenly distributed. When we talk about Kubernetes, I don't even want to open the can of worms uh, because, you know, it's a, it's a complicated, you know, and that's the beauty is that there's a booming ecosystem around it. If you look in CNC of landscape, there are so many logos. Uh, the point I want to ask is that as the adoption is open source technology is growing, what are some of the pain points that you see are common? Because what happens with the, let's say, proprietary commercial software is you have one throat to choke, you get a solution from a specific vendor. With open source, what happens is either you can do it yourself if you are big enough or you have teams or you have to go with a vendor. So what kind of pain point that you see is, uh, people often uh, face when it comes to embracing open source technologies. Uh, did you cover that in the survey? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And and we specifically ask, what are your open source support issues, right? Um, actually, before I answer that, let me tell you first when we ask, what are the reasons you are selecting those open source technologies, right? Because there's a correlation. And, and there were three uh, reasons to select the specific open source technologies. And by the way, we asked this question on every category, right? So from data technologies to you know, DevOps and programming languages, frameworks, and so on. And number one was, well, I want uh, something that uh, keeps growing, right? That keeps updating, that I have new releases, new versions, a, a release life cycle. Um, the other is I, I want, uh, I, I choose this technology because it's robust, because it's stable, right? And they were looking for those, those open source projects. And then the third one was interesting because they said, well, if we already have the expertise, in-house expertise on some of those technologies, most likely we're going to use, we're going to continue to use those open source technologies, right? So if I have someone that is already familiar with Apache, you know, Kafka, well, most likely I'm going to continue to use Apache Kafka on all my projects. Now, moving these three uh, top reasons to select open source technology, now to answer your question around the support challenges, uh, they, they, they correlate actually very interesting, right? Number one support challenge is keeping up with all those updates and all those patches, right? Now that there's obviously more awareness around open source security, you know, most vulnerabilities already have a fix. More, you just have to keep up with the patches, right? Updating the patches. So that was a support, a uh, uh, top support uh, issue. Uh, the second one was uh, a bit more related to software in general, which is, we need support, we need help with configuration, with scalability, with you know installations, right? The setup. And that's just part of the you know the, the expertise that you need on the technologies. And then the third one, I was talking about, you know, if you have someone that is already familiar with the technology, most likely you're gonna to continue to use that. Well the NAM the 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 top uh, support challenge is the lack of experience 
and proficiency on those open source technologies, right? People saying, hey, I want to start using uh, Podman and Kubernetes, but I don't have the expertise, right? Or I'm gonna have to go and hire a lot of people, expensive resources. Or, you know, I wanna start doing some AI and machine learning models. I can start, uh, you know, we can do open source free software, but I need the expertise to help me with that. And uh, I mean, there are other reports, actually, the Linux Foundation just uh, issued the, the uh, jobs report. And, you know, it's very clear that uh, it's a good time to be an engineer. It's a good time to, to know about all these open source technologies because they are in high demand. Right. Uh, so well said. Now, um, since you uh, are associated with the company, which, you know, is all free commercial support, what we have seen with open source is that open source solves day one problem. You can get the code, get it started. Day two challenges are different where, you know, uh, updating the software, patching it, keeping it safe and secure, is scaling it. And more importantly, the features, functionality that you need, what happens with open source, not everybody in the community needs that and community goes with you know what mo most people want. So that functionality or feature may not be uh, updated or it may never go to the upstream because not everybody wants it. That's where commercial players come uh, into picture. Also these commercial players, keep open source sustainable the you know you folks uh, not only contribute code you you also pay a lot of developers who are in the payrolls and you also support organizations as well so can you also talk about the commercial aspect of open source uh, to just you know uh, reinforce the view that it is like a, a, a some symbiotic relationship between you know commercial software and open source or commercial players who are supporting open source and also it, it, when you uh, the reason i'm asking is that when you ask the survey when folks use open source do they also look at the fact that this open source software also have some commercial backing so that they do know that tomorrow if they need support they can go uh, and ring the bell of that company I wrote a blog post exactly about about this, right? And uh, I'll probably send the link there um, because I, I talk about these topics, right? The, the the use of open source, and then what are the differences with uh, with commercial open source software, right? Um, the case of the commercial open source software, I think it's very clear today that that we have basically two models, if if people want to call it models, or or two approaches uh, to commercialize open source. Um, one is, uh, you know, open core, right? Uh, organizations uh, contributing to open source, supporting open source, growing open source, right? Uh, and there are many ways to do that. Many of them uh, being part of uh, um, foundations, uh, Linux foundations, Apache foundations, and all the other uh, foundations. And uh, but then building a business with uh, commercial uh, components, paid components around that open core. Uh, the, the other successful model is the, the SaaS software as a service, right? The hosting uh, open source software, from take care of the maintenance, take care of some of the keeping up with the updates and the patches that we were just talking about. So uh, organizations can uh, select to, for some of the technologies, just to stay with open source software, uh, maybe get the support from from other places, not just the community, but uh, organizations like the one I represent and Open Logic by Perforce, uh, or they can go for the commercial version of open source. You know, help, helping them with the support, helping them with the, the maintenance, kind of peace of mind uh, to have someone to call when there's where there's an issue. Um, I, I think we are um, uh, growing both ways, right? And we see so many startups now that the model is just going with open source software, right? They, they just, they go and, and do open source. I work for a couple of startups where we were consuming, you know, just because of cost, we, everything was based on open source software, right? And that also brings me to the next question, since you have so much vast experience uh, with open source, and today, most companies that we are discussing, you know, what, what advice you would give to companies who are relying a lot of open source, they are running their whole business on top of open source, how they should also become active players or contributors? It's not necessary that they should really invest all the resources. Not every company has all the resources to invest, but how they should participate in the whole, you know, win-win uh, uh, game uh, of open source so that, uh, once again, 
they are not a third party who are sitting outside and consuming without having any say in the open source project. So talk about that also. Yeah, I mean, look, we, we see more and more uh, companies that are not specifically considered technology companies, but they are across uh, other verticals, across other industries, obviously fine. The financial services industry, banking, uh, telecom, you know, so many other industries that are heavily involved on open source today. Now, one of the things that uh, that we ask on the, on the survey that we show in the report is, you know, the level of maturity on using open source, right? And, and going back to your question of, you know, how how do they how should they start if they are already using consuming open source, you know, take the next step to start open sourcing some of your software or you know developing the open in a public repository. Uh, or um, you know, thinking about getting more uh, you know formalized that um, there are a couple of things, a couple of trends actually. Now, uh, one is uh, inner source, which is you know a way to start, right? Bring some of the or, or all of those open source best practices in terms of having everyone working um, uh, together, collaborating. But inner source is behind behind closed doors right within the company you know you have multiple divisions might have different uh, uh, parts of the organization and make them work together inner source uh, it's seen as a you know great best practice and could be also a first step into you know once we're done with this project we can open source that the second piece is uh, the second potential step is to formalize uh, create an, an office, what it's known as uh, Open Source Program Office today, or OSPOS. Uh, in the in the report, we uh, about only about 15% of our respondents uh, have a, an OSPO, an Open Source Program Office. Uh, about 14% have an inner source inner source or, uh, initiatives or or projects. Uh, but depending on the industry, for example, the uh, uh, financial banking insurance industries they do more uh, uh, inner source projects and they also have more uh, open source program offices. Uh, just like you have a, a CISO, right? You have an office for security. Well, why not having an office for open source that will help you with you know, compliance, licensing, strategically what to work on, what to invest on and what to consume. And it, you know, by the way, you know, keeping up with the latest versions and you know, addressing security, right? So many, many good functions. We see that, I see that as a trend. Uh, recently on the open source uh, summit, there were a lot of talks. Actually, it was a full track around uh, OSPOS, open source program offices. Excellent. Uh, now that leads to create a two fork in our discussion. Number one, I do want to talk about open source summit. You were the at the event. What kind of discussion you saw there? You did touch that there were dedicated tracks about the open source program. But what what was the theme this year? Because uh, there was a big gap because of pandemic. Folks are now getting comfortable. They were there. So talk about you know what was your observation there? Uh, well, first of all, it was well attended in in Austin, Texas. So so that was good to see a lot of people. Uh, in person. Um, for me, three takeaways. Um, number one, I, I would say about half or maybe roughly around half of the sessions, they were talking about security, right? So open source security is top of mind, you know, sessions that talked about uh, vulnerabilities and, and, and finding vulnerabilities and putting together all these different uh, repositories of vulnerabilities, uh, they were well attended. So definitely uh, it's top of mind. I, uh, obviously the open source uh, security uh, foundation is doing some great job. I mean, you know, uh, recently with the, with the executive order, the White House executive order, and then some follow-ups on that, uh, there are uh, 10 streams of work that they are actually getting funded. So there's a lot of activity there. And obviously that was, that was a big topic on, on the conference. Uh, the other takeaway for me is, uh, Many of the sessions talked about and, and keynotes talk about the, the skills gap, right? And, and I mentioned it earlier, uh, the, the fact that, uh, you know, we keep growing, there are more technologies and uh, we don't have as many engineers or developers uh, or operations engineers, IT operations, uh, security experts on, on, on those technologies. So uh, uh, there are a lot of initiatives around training, about, around um, certification on, on the technologies. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of stuff online, and and uh, and you know there are good steps on trying to address address that. In fact, that's one of the the streams around security and the initiatives uh, uh, with with the rest of the uh, rest of the industry. Uh, 
Uh, and then the third uh, takeaway, I think uh, we hear more and we're taking actions around um, diversity and inclusion. There was a very moving uh, keynote about that. Uh, people, uh, I went to another kind of uh, discussion panel, people um, much more aware, much more inviting, uh, you know, contributing open source has always been diverse, right? Um, and uh, I think that there's more to come, uh, but I'm really happy to see, uh, you know, those initiatives and people talking about it. And the second thing I was going to talk about was uh, security, and you did touch upon that. So, you know, security has already been, you know, uh, taking a, you know, a center stage in every respect because uh, we have seen a lot of, uh, you know, vulnerabilities and a lot of exploitative. But open source security is becoming more important because once again, everybody is running open source. But it is also very, very challenging if you want to talk about software supply chain. It's not just one product or service, depending on, as you said, whether it's SaaS or whatever it is, it's relying on not only so many different open source projects from different, you know, organizations. Within those projects, there are different libraries. And then, you know, when you are creating a, your, you know, container images, you are pulling, you know, once again, packages from no, no one knows what uh, repositories out there. Uh, there may be multiple maintainers of the same project. So from your perspective, did you also ask, uh, the concerns folks may have with security when they are embracing open source, or they're like, hey, because it's open source, it's secure. What did you, uh, you know, what insights you gather in this report? Yeah, it, it's it's interesting, right? So I mentioned that uh, that's one of the major top three challenges in terms of keeping up with, uh, with updates and, and patches. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with everything you just mentioned, right? That that's the that's the bottom line. That's the that's the issue with with security. Now, I I don't think it's necessarily just about open source. It's about all software, right? Just the difference is that you know proprietary software you just don't have access to the source code, <laughs> but you don't know how many vulnerabilities are there. Uh, it's also based on open source software, uh, and that's why some initiatives around uh, bill of materials or software bill of materials are are getting traction, right? Because like, if every product out there has an, the the nutrients that you're gonna consume, the number of calories and and uh, ingredients, well, why not doing that for software and have a better idea of what it's in there? And when there's a you know a lock for J uh, zero one uh, zero uh, critical vulnerability, why not go in and, and easily go and find you know, the number one challenge, by the way, with Log4j or for most uh, critical vulnerabilities is where in my software, what software I'm using that has that library, right? And it could be not just a direct library, but a dependency that it's, you know, three, four layers down the chain, uh, the, the software supply chain. So uh, there are multiple initiatives. My my advice, and, and we, we talked a lot about this at OpenLogic is, you know, keep up, keep up with the releases, and your patches. And uh, if you know you have a production mission critical application out there that you don't want to touch, right? <laughs> well, test it. You know, pre-production environments. Make sure that you test your patches, your updates, and go for it because the risks are higher than doing nothing, right? And uh, the way I convince people is I just tell them, look. You don't want your company name out there in the news, right? That's the next, <laughs> the next breach or the next uh, ransomware. Uh, uh, you 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 want to take care of your security. You want to take care of your uh, your patches. Hey, Weir, thank you so much for taking time out today. And not only talk about the company, and but also especially the report. Uh, also share your insights that what are the pain points when people embrace open source and how there are you know contributing or becoming a good open source uh, citizen. So thanks for sharing all those insights. And I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here.